Good day, ladies and gentlemen. FY23 earnings conference call of Nirlon Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone first. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anuj Sonpal from Valorem Advisors. Thank you. And over to you, Mr. Sonpal. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Anuj Sonpal from Valorem Advisors. We represent the Investor Relations of Nerlon Limited. On behalf of the company, I would like to thank you all for participating in the company's earnings call for the first quarter of financial year 2023. Before we begin, let me mention a short cautionary statement. Some of the statements made in today's con call may be forward-looking in nature. Such forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties which could cause actual results to differ from those anticipated. Such statements are based on management's beliefs as well as assumptions made by and information currently available to management. Audiences are cautioned not to place any undue reliance on these forward-looking statements when making any investment decisions. The purpose of today's earnings call is purely to educate and bring awareness about the company's fundamental business and financial court under review. Now, uh, let me introduce you to the management participating with us in today's earnings call and hand it over to them for opening remarks. We have with us Mr. Rahul Sagar, Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director, Mr. Kunal Sagar, Promoter and Non-Executive Director, Mr. Manish Parikh, Chief Financial Officer and VP of Finance, Mr. Jasmine Bhavsar, Company Secretary and Vice President Legal and Compliance Officer, and Mr. Ashish Baradia, Vice President of Business Development and Invest Relations of Nilan Management Services Private Limited. Now, without any further delay, I request Mr. Kunal Sagar to start with his opening remarks. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our earnings conference call for the first quarter of the financial year 2023. We hope everyone is safe and well. Let us take you through the financial performance of the company. For the first quarter of the financial year 23, the company reported a total income of approximately 139 crores, an increase of 1% from the previous quarter, with an EBITDA of 108 crores, a decrease of 5% from the previous quarter. Profit after tax stood at 14 crores, representing a flat margin of 10.22%. We will now explain the significant variations in the financials of this quarter from the previous quarter. There were one-time expenses incurred in quarter one financial year 23 of approximately 25 crores on account of refinancing of the company's loan, which were included in the finance costs, and an additional 86 lakhs included in the other expenses. The other expenses also include CSR expenses of approximately 3.4 crores for the full financial year 23, provided in Q1 of financial year 23 as per statutory requirements, and marketing fees of 3.5 crore rupees for a 10-year renewal, which is entirely charged to the PNL in this quarter due to there being no lock-in period as against other renewals where marketing fees are amortized over the lock-in period of the license. Annualized margins are expected to even out such quarterly variations. On the operational front, as you are aware, the company completed the development of Phase 5 at Nirla Knowledge Park and licensed the entire phase five development comprising of 1.16 million square feet of chargeable area with effects from December 15, 2021 to J.P. Morgan Services India Private Limited for a period of 10 years. J.P. Morgan has begun paying license fees as per the agreement from 15 May 2022 onwards as contracted. Income and expenses relating to phase five are recognized in the profit and loss account with effects from December 15, 2021 as per India. This is the primary reason for increase in license fees and profitability in the fourth quarter of financial year 23 versus the same period in the previous financial year. The overall occupancy rate of NKP stood at 97.1% in this quarter as compared to 98% in the previous quarter. Barclays renewed approximately 94,000 square feet of its space due for renewal and expiring in 2023. Anunta approximately 13,000 square feet of space also due for renewal in 2023. 
road source license an additional approximately 5,000 square feet, and FMB operators renewed approximately 1,600 square feet at NKT. Two parties licensed approximately 4,300 square feet at Nirlal House, of which 75%, that is 3,200 square feet, is Nirlal's share. As on 30th June 2022, approximately 90,000 square feet area was vacant. Of this vacant area, the company has signed an LOI for approximately 37,000 square feet. Cultfit, the gym operator, has given notice to vacate approximately 6,000 square feet in September 2022. Additionally, comma, in a recent development, comma, during the first week of August, City Bank has renewed approximately 160,000 square feet at NKP. Of this, 129,000 square feet was due for renewal in financial year 23, and the balance was due for renewal in financial year 2024. As on 30th June 2022, the total secured debt facility sanctioned by HB, H, sorry, HSBC was 1,230 crores, which includes an overdraft facility, while the debt outstanding from HSBC was 1,150 crores. With this, we conclude our presentation and open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone phone. If you wish to withdraw yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Lakshya Jain from Inam Holdings. Please go ahead. No, am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah. 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 My first question, sir. Uh, we have paid 3.4 crore as CSR for FI23. Statutory non state corporates must pay 2% of net profit as CSR. So this implies that we will be making net profits of around 170 plus crore in FI23. Am I right, sir? Is your reading right? The CSR regulations say that 2% of net profit is to be spent based on the previous three years, the average of the previous three years. So that's what this number is based on. Okay. 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 My next question, sir. If I'm not wrong, there are two ways to get converted into rate. That is either STV or through GST. I have a doubt under STV, sir. Say, for example, if GIC has 60% holding in XYZ rate, then for Nirlon to be part of that rate, should GIC reduce its holding in Nirlon to gain 60% or is it possible with the current 70% holding at this, sir? Sorry, I'm not sure we understand your question very well. Uh, shall, I should, shall I repeat, sir? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, if you can repeat because it's yeah, yeah, not yeah, really yeah. clear to us what your, uh, you know, what the specific uh, question is in terms of. No, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll do it. Say, for example, if GIC has 60% holding in XYZ rate company, then. For Nirlon to be part of tax rate, should GIC reduce its holding in Nirlon to the same 60% or is it possible with the current 70% holding through STD? Frankly, that's, that's not, uh, at this point, that's not uh, an answer that we have available. Uh, we wouldn't want to try and answer it while guessing. If you want to, you know, if you want to be in touch with us specifically, and we can try and understand a little better your question, so we don't give you a wrong answer. Is that all right? Definitely, that's on me. It's a very specific situation you're answering, and we're not sure that we necessarily understand it correctly. So we'd rather understand it from you properly and then try and answer. Yeah, better, better. All right. No, you don't, you don't, have, to repeat, you don't have to repeat. It's just something that may be better answered. Uh, offline so we can understand that in fact we are understanding you correctly because we don't want to give you a generic answer without specifically understanding your uh, exact question. Yes, sir. Fair enough, sir. 
Okay, uh, my last question, sir. Then, in the recent BLS earnings on call, they were very clear on the fact that they are REIT ready. GIC and BLS are just waiting for the right time to launch the DCC BL REIT. Are we also sailing on the same boat, sir? It's a question that I think perhaps is uh, it, it, it's not something that we are aware of, and uh, the DLF GIC REIT frankly has nothing to do with uh, middle on. So. Uh, again, it's not something that we would want to uh, really comment on, except to say that uh, we have no connection with the DLF GIC REIT. Uh, no, sir. No. The, re yeah. the meaning of my question is that they are waiting for the right time to launch the REIT. So, are we also planning in a similar way? No, I, I think our uh, situation as far as the REIT goes is very different from the from what uh, the you know, they are they're, they're read ready and they're looking for an appropriate time to launch from what we understand uh, we yeah. are in a situation where we are as we have said in our previous calls we are in the process of evaluating what is the best option in terms of restructuring from the launch in terms of read in terms of delisting and how that is to be done right and that is a discussion that continues to evolve at our end as we have uh, mentioned in other calls and as we can again mention in this call so I think the two circumstances are very different. Uh, one is a situation where the DLF, JAC, if as you say, as per their call, they're ready and they're waiting for the right time to do the read. The other is a situation where we are still evaluating and the discussion is still evolving as to what is the best structure that Nirlan should evolve to going forward. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashok Jain from Ayush Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Am I audible, sir? Yes, please proceed. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, sir, in your previous uh, call call, uh, we have been discussing that uh, Nirlon can become a REIT uh, through a SCP route as uh, one of the possibilities. The other possibility you told was a delisting, but uh, that's not the right place to discuss. So I just want to concentrate on this SCP route, sir. So India has a three listed uh, REIT entity uh, distributing quarterly dividends based on their uh, net distributable cash flow, NDCF. Sir, even we have traveled a lot and uh, sacrificing a good amount of cash flow and paying taxes uh, corporate taxation in old regime and now in this quarter we have paid almost two percent penalty on the foreclosure of uh, sdfc loan sir correct i request you to share your knowledge as per current uh, PLN account and balance sheet the ndc that is the uh, net distribution cash flow Nirlan could have if uh, Nirlan were to be uh, part of a listed rate as an uh, spv sir so I want you to explain to us uh, that uh, uh, how how depreciation is added back to uh, cash flow, how uh, uh, amortization of uh, debt is added back to cash flow. This is what I want from you, sir. Mr. Jain, I'm again not very we are not very clear about. Are you asking what is our cash flow or what our cash flow will be under the REIT or what what exactly is the what would you like us to explain? We can very clearly tell you about what our cash flow is. We wouldn't want to speculate what our cash flow will or will not be under the REIT situation. We can tell you what our cash flow is just now. Is that something that you'd like to hear? Uh, no, the, the cash flow, there is, as per the profit and loss account, we do have net profit. And the depreciation, we are providing around 36 crore per quarter. So in case if we were a REIT, this 36 crore will go to the cash flow, I suppose, for the distribution of dividend. Uh, whether the government uh, uh, puts uh, taxes after depreciation and that amount goes or the uh, whole depreciation that is 145 crore will go to the cash flow for distribution of dividend. Can you hold on just a second? We will try and uh, see if yeah, we can yes, sir. Yes, sir. understand that uh, a little better. Just a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Mr. Jain sees this answers your question, right? Our understanding is that the depreciation in any case, in any situation is going to get added back to the cash flow. It's a non-cash item regardless, right? So is, is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Because yes. Uh, in this the current uh, regime, we don't pay taxes on depreciation amount. And if it is added back to cash flow for uh, distribution of uh, this uh, dividend under REIT, this whole amount of depreciation will be added to the new cash flow, I suppose. No? Am I right? So again, we don't want to be speculating what we will be under the REIT. That's not really... No, no, uh, it's not a specific to Nirvan. I'm, I say it's applicable to embassy also. It's applicable to mind space. Uh, just because we have been telling for last few quarters that we are working very hard to understand the regulations. Uh, yeah. That's the reason why I'm asking. Yeah, that's the reason why I'm asking. I mean, I, I think in our understanding, in any case, depreciation is always a non-cash item and whatever the amount of depreciation is will, will form part of the cash flow. I don't know if that is specifically answering your question, but that's that's what we are, uh, that, that's our understanding of what you are trying to ask. So, are, are we right? So, your question is essentially what you're, just to answer your question, to understand your question, you're saying, for example, for Q1 FI23, uh, yeah. you want to... Your question is, will we add back this 369 million to the 142 million of profit after yes. tax for calculation? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, you know, uh, 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 yes, I think. I mean, yes, I mean, of course, the dividend is paid based on the availability and the, it's based on the eligibility that the company is eligible for, A, and B, after we uh, after we analyze what the company is eligible for the dividend is also based on the availability of the cash flow uh, along with the eligibility that the company is eligible to pay in a particular financial year so theoretically uh, theoretically or practically this the 369 of the dividend can be added back to the, uh, uh, to the which is which is the depreciation can be added back to the profit after tax provided the company is eligible to pay that amount in that particular financial year. Uh, the, but uh, uh, shall we be adding 36 crore or will be adding 20 crore that is uh, paying taxes on uh, this thing uh, depreciation also? Uh, this is what I'm asking. Yeah. I think, Mr. Jain, we will have to, we will have to try and, rather than just speculate, we will have to have a discussion with you to understand exactly what you are saying. Again, we don't want to have a, uh, 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 give a wrong answer. We are not able to exactly understand. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Jain, depreciation yeah. is a tax yeah. deductible expense. Yeah. So, to that extent, uh, the tax will not be payable on that amount, which is charged to p &L account. Okay. Which is, which is not anything different from what uh, we've always been doing. Uh, it's just a, a normal situation. No, so under REITs also, depreciation is not uh, taxable. It's a tax deductible expense. So, uh, we, we, again, we don't want to... That is yeah, our, that's, our understanding as far as SPV is under the REIT goes, because SPVs are also under company Act. Okay. But again, specific REIT regulations, maybe we are not the right people. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I'll get back to you sir, offline. Huh? And the second is uh, regarding this, uh, uh, we have taken, a, I think, a moratorium of five years for the new loan from SSBC. And uh, we are going to repay 70% in the 10th year. So just want to have the color, uh, what uh, what shall be the amortization of SPB level debt in case uh, Nirlon takes a uh, reach uh, offer through SPB? Any idea on this, sir? Uh, I'm sorry, I, you know, I think there's a lot, you, a lot of your questions are making an assumption that we are going to become a reach and uh, it's not really something that we would like to, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's we we are not sure that that is we we are going to be able to answer that in any meaningful manner for you because uh, we we can certainly answer the question in terms of insofar as our structure today is concerned but uh, this the 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 the, the, the questions that you are mentioning in terms of what we might do if and when we are reached is not something we would want to get into at all because it's very speculative uh, in terms of what kind of uh, 
structure there may or may not be at that point. So do excuse us for not answering something that is related to what might happen if the law becomes the read. Uh, I, uh, basically, my intention is uh, not to go for a speculative uh, statement. I just want to know uh, where does Nirlon stand? Because uh, these two options you have mentioned in our previous calls many times that uh, we can uh, go, we can make a read through either through a releasing or through a SCP existing. In case we are going through a SCP, I just wanted to understand the legalities of that. Uh, that's only. Uh, that is the only point. That is the point we had made uh, quite clearly last time, Mr. Jain. We had said that, in theory, if I remember the discussion correctly, and we will check, there were two options. One is the traditional option where we would do a delisting and then go by yeah. one could delisting and then move forward with the process of the delisted company forming part of a REIT. The other question which we had said, if I remember, that is theoretically uh, something that is also being looked at to see whether it's possible or not was whether Nirlon as a listed entity could be held by a REIT which is also a listed entity. That was what we had said and that was where we had said there was no precedent yet for any such situation and that was Nirlon's situation specifically where a listed entity would hold Nirlon as the listed entity. That, I think that is the circumstance that we had discussed last time. So okay. if we are on the same page then that is, and again, we had said on that situation that we don't know if such a scenario is in fact possible or not. And that was one of the discussions that was uh, being undertaken to understand whether that was an option or not. In last three months, what's a new development that happened on this uh, race part? Sorry, could you repeat? Uh, no, what's the current situation now? What's that uh, new development happened in this? Last one quarter, uh, any progress we have made? The discussions are uh, continuing to evolve based on where we were last time. We continue to evaluate what has to be done and we are moving forward. Uh, there is no conclusion to those discussions yet and we will continue to evaluate and we will continue to evolve this discussion until it reaches a level where we are sure that the, the direction we want to go is the right one from the company's point of view for the uh, long term. Uh, and those discussions continue as we said. There, there's no conclusion on those again. Okay, sir. All the best, sir. All the best on the side, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Harshit Bulecha from Flair Investment. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, so like uh, my questions might not be comfortable for you to answer as uh, other shareholders are also not been answered. I would request you kindly get time for our question offline, sir. You're always welcome to ask us any questions offline and we'll of course yeah. do our best to try and answer them also. Thanks a lot, sir. But uh, if, if I ask my question, I don't think you'll be comfortable. I'll, I'd like to wait for the offline discussion, sir. Entirely your... Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Please, go ahead. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants to press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Samarth Singh from TPF Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. How are you? Good, good. How are you guys? Fine, fine. Thank you. Uh, on the... Uh, this. Uh, one agreement that we've done without the lock-in, uh, is that sort of reflective of a weaker rental environment? Uh, Hamad, I think an agreement without a lock-in is basically happening after nine years of being within the campus, and it's not really there's no lock-in, there's a lock-in of approximately 12 months. There's a notice period of approximately 12 months. So uh, these are not fresh agreements, these are renewals, so the licensee feels that since they've been here for nine years, they're not obligated to be locked in further. It's not reflective of anything to do with the market or post-COVID or anything of that nature to the best of our understanding. Uh, I think it, it's purely the fact that the licensee feels that he's already given us a lock-in of 36 months or 60 months or whatever it is in the initial life. Uh, that would be our uh, understanding and, and in fact some of the agreements that are that we are 
uh, either have completed or are in the process of discussing have lock-ins that are again approximately three years and in some cases even longer than three years. Right. So it's not, we, we don't believe it's any reflective of anything that is a weakening of the sentiment post-COVID or anything along those lines, just to specifically answer your thoughts. Yeah, and also the, uh, I think the agreement you're referring to, the, the period of the agreement is almost nine, uh, is not, is, is nine years and of course uh, uh, the lock-in uh, is, is uh, 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 or the, uh, the, the, the notice period may be 12 months, but the lock-in is in fact, uh, but the agreement period is in fact nine years. So it's not that they're trying to come down to three or two to five or some such thing, you know. So, so uh, yeah, that, that would be uh, an accurate understanding, we feel. Gotcha. And uh, just uh, for better understanding of just in general, as far as our contracts are concerned, do they all work similarly where after the initial contract is over, in renewals, most clients do not give a lock-in? Is that understanding correct? Or not, is that... It's not entirely the case. There are uh, renewals now which we have recently signed where the lock-in is approximately 24 plus six months, or so 24 months of lock-in plus six months of notice. So it may not be 60 months or it may not be 36 months, but you know, it, it's something which we think it varies, uh, and uh, of course, to some extent, the commercials are linked. Right. Uh, to some extent, to a longer lock-in as well. So you know, it's it's a it's a combination of uh, these factors. But yeah, I mean, you you will have uh, a case where it may be 12 months of notice period, but you may have a case where it's 24 or 6, and you can have a case where we we do have cases where there's where it's the regular 36 months as well. Gotcha. And uh, any anything happening on Nirlon House, you think there's a possibility of some sort of uh, value unlocking happening there in the in you know, near future? That's a, a, a good question. Samat is asking whether what we are doing for what are our plans for Nirlon House and any value unlocking. See, some of the issues because of our uh, historical. Uh, uh, because of the historical issues with the company, the company owns about 55% uh, of the lawn house along uh, uh, with nine other owners. Of the 55%, about 75% is owned by NL and 25% is an undivided share from the Lawn Foundation Trust. But the real fact is because there are nine other owners and, and these are not institutional owners, these are private owners, and as you, as you may understand, private owners all have completely different views and completely different priorities. Uh, so the issue really is how we unlock our value in a building which is strata owned, which is not the easiest uh, thing to do under any circumstances, because of course we don't want to give away value uh, for no reason. Uh, so yes, you know we, we we are looking at this very seriously right now. The space that we have is almost uh, is rented except for maybe one one space of 1500 square feet. The rest of the space is completely rented. Uh, is completely licensed. Yeah, is completely licensed. Um, exclu excluding the basement. When I said 1500 square feet, it's excluding the basement. So yeah, I mean. Uh, we have we have had some preliminary discussions and uh, as and when we we form up something as to which way we want to go with NH we would uh, uh, be happy to let you know but we do agree with you that because of the location of the asset it is a uh, 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 we would be very interested to unlock value yes I uh, got you I just you know we have uh, done this. A uh, wonderful job with phase five, and I think it's more or less done now. So I guess your investors are just wondering what's next, right? And uh, you know, whether it's Nilon House or whether it's a REIT or something, we're hoping that uh, uh, you know management comes up with a plan uh, soon. Yes, yes, on, yes. On the REIT part, in any case, I think you know we've been uh, repeatedly mentioning that. Obviously, that's a significant, let's not call it the read, we'll just call it in terms of what future structure one would want to do going forward. That's something that we've been uh, trying to explain on every call, that that's something that is 
the highest priority to see what might be uh, an appropriate uh, structure to transition to or to evolve to. Uh, similarly, uh, in a middle house is something that we understand needs to be addressed. Uh, we just, and as Rahul said, we just want to make sure that we do that in a way that doesn't leave any that doesn't leave any value on the table for no reason. We just want to make sure we do it right. Uh, again, it's one of those legacy situations that we've untangled to a very large extent, and I think the last, uh, hopefully we can get the last aspect of this uh, also done sooner rather than later. Great. Thanks a lot. Man. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Arunima Jain from the Chatterjee Group. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, apologies, I missed a few minutes of uh, initial minutes of the call, so it may be a repetitive question, but and I hear a bit of it in the last uh, question. My question is mainly on phase five. Where are we in terms of uh, getting it operational, and when and can we expect some revenues and flow, uh, if not already? Um, in case it is operational, what would be the breakup between um, phase five and rest of the uh, so, okay. so essentially, uh, the license fee pre period started on December 15, 2021. The license fee started five months after that on the 15th of May. So, as of 15th of May 2022, license fees have commenced in phase five for approximately 11.6 lakhs uh, square feet. This 11.6 lakhs square feet is um, uh, is part of a total, we say, uh, approximately 33-34% of the total area in KP, which is approximately 3 million square feet of chargeable area at 80%, except for one building in B3, uh, except for the B3 building, which is approximately 300,000 square feet, which is at 75% efficiency. So that's, that's where it is. And uh, uh, yeah, we are, we, are, we are happy to tell you that license fee free period started in December 15th and license started on May 15th for 11.6 lakhs square feet. And phase oh. 5, the, fees, uh, the license fees from phase 5 are approximately 35% of, uh, of the total license fee income, uh, approximately. And so of the 138 uh, crore of top line, what uh, percentage would that be? It's about 17 to 18 crores per month, roughly, is the license fee from phase 5. Okay. Let's say 17 crores. So maybe 54 crores for the quarter, roughly. Understood. Understood. That's helpful. And also, um, I could see a little bit on the leverage. Um, um, have we increased the leverage in the last quarter? If you could throw some light on that. No, not at all. Uh, in fact, we refinanced, uh, as we've written in our IR report, and as mm -hmm. we mentioned, uh, so we have refinanced uh, loan in the last quarter in the Q1 of financial year 23. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we paid, so we paid back 1,180 crores to uh, HDFC and uh, HSBC refinanced that. The facility is for 1,230 crores, mm -hmm. of which 80 crores is an OD facility, uh, and 1,150 is a term loan facility. So that is uh, that is remain unchanged. That's an LRD that we have with uh, HSBC now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Laksh Jain from Enam Holdings. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes. I am here just for uh, one correction, but I am not from Enam Holdings. I am from Sad Holdings. And we are just to clarify that so that there is no uh, any issues in the future. Can we uh, take the correction? Sure. Yeah, thank you. My questions have been uh, answered. All my questions have been answered. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashok Jain from Ayush Tapati. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, Mr. Jain. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I have only one question. On our HSBC outstanding debt of 1150 crores, is our interest rate of 6.1% fixed rate or floating rate, sir? That's it. So, 
our interest rate is a floating rate okay. Okay. and we have it from 2nd of May when we refinanced we have a 6 month period where it will not change and it will be floating after that linked to 3 months T bill. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> As there are no further questions, I now hand the conference over to Mr. Kunal Sagar for from Non Limited for closing comments. Thank you all very much for participating on the poll. Uh, as always, we appreciate your interest. And the uh, couple of questions that we had said might be better addressed uh, offline, off, off please do feel free to be in touch with us and we'll do our best to help you answer those questions. Thank you. Yeah. On behalf of Nirlon Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.